in the past, we, we've seen Christopher Lambert. We've seen a lot of the original movie actors. Any chance we might see some of the digitized actors make an appearance? <laughs> Welcome to the Realmcast, Earthrealm's ultimate Mortal Kombat podcast and the official podcast of Mortal Kombat Online. Prepare yourselves as we dive into the depths of the Mortal Kombat multiverse, bringing you well-known and significant members of the community. I'm your host, the Mortal Kombat Phantom, and with me as always is my co-host, our lore master Yanni. Welcome, Yanni. Thank you, Phantom. This is the Realmcast, where every warrior has a story to tell. We've been waiting a very long time to be able to say these words. Today's combatants are none other than Ed Boon, John Tobias, Carrie Hoskins, and Sal DeVita. Yes, that's right. And you're probably wondering, where are they? Why are they not in the studio or, you know, in the panels around us right now? Uh, that's because we did it live in person recently at Cleveland Gaming Classic, this amazing uh, video game convention up in Cleveland, Ohio. And it was all in support of charity for the Raiden Science Foundation. The Raiden Science Foundation. There we are. See a little Raiden bracelet as well. Not as cool as your shirt may be, I don't know. But it wasn't just the panel, by the way. We did a panel and we did a live drawing session with John Tobias, where we got to sit down and ask him various questions that haven't been asked of John. Ever. So yeah, so you're in for quite the treat today. But before we go into that, we actually had several people stop by our booth. Yeah, we had a lot of people passing by. It was really cool. Like. Uh, Everybody was just hanging out at the booth and everything. It was it was really nice to see the Mortal Kombat community all come together, right? And so we thought we'd take the opportunity to do sort of mini interviews and ask the community what Mortal Kombat meant to them. So we're going to showcase that up next and stick around because we got a packed show today. After that, we have the actual reunion panel. And then we have uh, a quick little interview with the founder of the Rain Science Foundation before we go into the John Tobias drawing session. So... We have a lot of stuff on today's episode. Tell me, what does Mortal Kombat mean to you? It's the game of my life. Growing up, this was the game I wasn't supposed to play. So I snuck into my friend's house, played it there all the time. I eventually got my parents to let me play the game. They let me escape uh, into the world of these video games and have a great time with these characters. Here we are 20, 30 years later, and we're enjoying these stories. It's, it's, been, it's been part of my life. It's great. In my early days, it meant something completely different, but as I've grown older and met a lot of people, a lot of people that have been in my life for a long time now, it means friendship. As corny as that might sound, the things that we do for each other, the things that we do for people like Tommy and his family with the Raiden Science Foundation, coming together, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's really cool now. It's the friendship. Evil Emperor X, tell us, what does Mortal Kombat mean to you? What's Mortal Kombat? <laughs> well, I, I thought we were here for a Street Fighter convention, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, these, these are the, the Tekken guys, right? Street Fighter. Street, Street Fighter, oh, okay, right. So, what Street Fighter means to me... <laughs> no, yeah, Mortal Kombat, I mean, it doesn't mean anything, really. It's just, it's just a game, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not that important. It's just, you know, it's been with me my entire life. Since I was like four, watching the, the movies, playing some of the original arcade games. I mean, it means a lot to me. So, you know, I've had a lot of fandoms growing up, right? I've had like, you know, I'm a huge comic book guy, follow a lot of like DC Comics, Marvel, stuff like that. But probably the most prevailing fandom for me since I was young that's always stuck around has been Mortal Kombat. So I think it's the most consistent, life-changing media for me. I think it's fantastic. It's just, it's a part of me. So that's my actual answer. It, it means... No, no, History it means mythology. It means. What does telling the say? Today it means family. Tabak ninety nine. Hey, what's going on, what's going on? This is Tabak ninety nine. Tell us, what does Mortal Kombat mean to you? Man, Mortal Kombat just means the world to me, or you could say it means the realms to me. I got into Mortal Kombat right from the first game with a bunch of friends. It was a very social activity. And thanks to Mortal Kombat and the online community, I've made even more friends. In addition to the social aspect, it's also helped me broaden my horizons. When I was young and I got into the internet and I saw how Mortal Kombat web pages worked, I wanted to get in on this. I wanted to learn web design, graphic illustration, and I wanted to just learn everything there was that I could put together my own Mortal Kombat website. And of course, I got into sprite comics because of it. I got into help working with other people to make flash animations. 
not me personally, because I can't really animate, but I learned important computer skills, HTML, YouTube videos, video editing, audio editing, right? No, that's seriously. It's, it's really helped me become a better person and grow. And it's like they say, Mortal Kombat is not about death, but about friendship. Friendship? It's yeah. not quite the line, but you know what I mean. <laughs> My entire childhood, being able to be a character and see their story. That's why so many people are dedicated to certain characters, because they become attached to them. And then to grow up and enjoy it and share it with your friends, which could be college friends, which evolved for me later on into hanging out with incredible people. Um, it's a Terry photo bomb. Yes. Sorry. No, it's amazing. But we're not I filming. <laughs> <laughs> but for prime example, Sony is awesome. But just being able to go and share that love with everybody, following my dreams of wanting to do something with Mortal Kombat. I bet you, Phantom, Scott Howell, of course, CC Shadow, uh, Tapbox99. The list is too long to name. I have friends from all over the globe, from Australia to New Zealand, from even South Korea. It's been incredible. To see it come back to Cleveland is awesome. Let's do more of these in Cleveland. Mortal Kombat is like everything. It's awesome. Banyani, Mortal Kombat, what it means to me is this. Like everything that is here, this event, the people, it's why we do what we do. It's what drives us. And Mortal Kombat Online, I just love it. It's why I've been doing this for 25 plus years and I'm glad to be here with you doing it. Why do I love this community? They're great. Mortal Kombat's awesome. Headlock Gaming, what does Mortal Kombat mean to you? Mortal Kombat to me means community, I would think, comes to mind. Uh, from someone that started in the first Mortal Kombat, seeing in the arcades the community that came together and how the community's grown over the years. People have their favorites. Mortal Kombat's realm is a great realm to escape from uh, the real world after a long day of work sometimes. And it's a great place to meet up with friends. And many of us have met great friends along the way, and it's great to see many of them here. I look forward to making many more friends over the years playing Mortal Kombat. It means everything to me, the game, the community, the co-creator. That's why I named my son Raiden after the God of Thunder. Mortal Kombat to me is my childhood and it's bonding with my nephew. When he was real little, that we spent a lot of our time playing Mortal Kombat 2 together and I never cut him any slack. <laughs> I taught him that, you know, life isn't gonna hand you anything. You gotta get better at it and, and uh, win on your own. But yeah, to me, it's like the nostalgia and the youth. Yeah, it's great. Johnny, what does Mortal Kombat mean to you? Well, to me, Mortal Kombat is a great way to bring people together. Because of Mortal Kombat and all these great people that I've met going to these conventions, I've had so many new opportunities, been to so many new places. I've been able to travel the world because of Mortal Kombat and meet so many interesting people. To be honest, Mortal Kombat means the world to me. Oh man, I... It means so much to me. It got me into video games. It got me into a lot of the things I enjoy nowadays and from a very young age. And just every time a new game comes out, it's a celebration. It's almost like a family reunion where I know that's corny, but it's like, oh, Liu Kang, Sonya, Johnny, how you guys been? All right, let's get down to business. These, these stories, these characters, the different interpretations. I'm always so excited. Heck, I'm taking off work for the new expansion this week. You know, Mortal Kombat to me is community and just a good time. It's a legacy franchise at this point, like going back with old friends and family. Yanni, what does Mortal Kombat mean to you? It is literally this, the fact that I've been able to meet everybody from the community after all these years of talking online and being able to finally meet you too in person for the first time ever. Like that, this is it, Me meeting you guys, meeting John, Tobias, Ed Boon, Kerry, Val. Being able to meet everybody here, but then also to be able to support such a cause, you know, the Raiden Science Foundation and that fight against rare diseases and actually make a difference. It's really nice to see the community coming together as one. Thank you, Yanni. Thank you, Fenton. So that was really cool to actually hear everybody's thoughts on what Mortal Kombat meant to them. You know, everybody seemed to have different answers, but also kind of had a common theme in, in really it just being the community. And I definitely felt that, you know, it, it, the entire convention. Yeah, and you know, it's crazy that everybody, you know, feels that way about Mortal Kombat because that's completely what we're about here at the Romcast of Mortal Kombat Online. Uh, we just want to basically take the Mortal Kombat community to the next level and showcase you know, them properly. Yeah, parts of them, parts of their identity that maybe people weren't aware of, you know, regardless of their involvement in Mortal Kombat, what it was specifically.
Yeah. And, and give everybody that same experience that we had over the weekend at Cleveland Gaming Classic. So uh, if you guys haven't checked out Mortal Kombat Online, you can visit at MortalCombatOnline.com or just go to RealmCast.com to see our show. And here is Phantom co-hosting the reunion panel with Corey of Cleveland Gaming Classic. This is a lot of fun. Enjoy. Phantom, I don't know if there is a best way to start. Because if I'm looking at all these great people up here, I'm looking at our amazing panelists that are about to come up here. And I think the only way we can start this properly is to give me some energy in the room. What do you say? I, I think we got the perfect word for this, actually. What is it? Can I get everybody in the crowd? We're going to yell, get over here in three, two, one. Get over here! Welcome, one and all, to the Mortal Kombat reunion panel. Y'all ready for a great time? My name is Corey. I'm the MC on the main stage. And I am the Mortal Kombat fan team, host of the Rome cast. Live official podcast, and we are happy to be here today. We're happy to have you as well. And here today, we are going to be welcoming some big names and some big excitement. So, today, you all have a very important job because we want you to be excited and to show your love of this franchise. Everyone, please welcome back to the main stage the final boss, Tom Jenkins, and of course, with Rain Science Foundation, Tommy Fam. Gentlemen, please come on up. All right, these guys are a very important part of making all this happen. So gentlemen, please, if you could, let's introduce those special guests. Sounds good, Corey. All right, first up to the stage is none other than game developer, versatile actor that portrayed amazing World Combat character in MK3, such as Cyrax, Sector, Naiwu, and Star Hurt Smoke, and other amazing characters such as my favorite, Raiden. Please welcome Sal DeVita. Round two, here we go. Next up, got iconic actress who brought you Sonya Blade in Mortal Kombat 3 and Kia in Mortal Kombat Mythologies. We've got the infamous and great friend of the show, Carrie Hoskins. Next up, we have the honor of welcome a legendary artist, concept creator, and the original mind behind the Mortal Kombat lore. Please welcome the cool creator of Mortal Kombat, John Tobias. Let's go! And last, but most certainly not least, CGC proudly welcomes fellow co creator of Mortal Kombat, renowned developer, and Guinness World Record holder for longest voice acting in video games, Mr. Ed Boon! Phantom, we're on the same stage as these four. I know, it's, it's royalty right up here right now. Phantom, I think since you are part of that Realm cast, I think you should have the first question, sir. All right, well... This question goes out to all four of you. It can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people, but what does Mortal Kombat mean to you? What does Mortal Kombat mean to me? Um, I think it's a great way for people to get together, do something exciting and fun, have a fantasy of, of really just beating the crap out of the person next to them. That's the way I started. Is it was like a great stress reliever for me. I, I suppose I would summarize Mortal Kombat as something that's been part of my life longer than it's not been in my life. John and I made the first game. We were in our twenties, and now we're not in our twenties. It's it's been something that that I don't think either of us would have expected to have lasted as long as it has. I'm hoping that at some day. It's considered, you know, you've used the term forever franchise, where it's just something that just last kind of like DC and Marvel and Star Wars, something that just kind of keeps going on. So it's been a part of my life longer than it hasn't. And uh, it's allowed me to kind of, you know, celebrate with good people like you all. Very similar to Ed, I think that I would not have guessed all those years ago that I would be on a stage, 55 years old, <laughs> talking about this game that I created along with a team. 
I think I was 21, 22 years old when we started it. And so it's just the whole experience has been surreal, but it means a lot to me uh, for it to still be relevant. And I think that uh, all of us owe a uh, huge debt of gratitude to Ed and the team at NetherRealm for keeping it alive and relevant and uh, just happy to be a part of it and happy that uh, I contributed uh, what I did. For me, it's been 30 years. Um, April 1994 is my first shoot in Mortal Kombat with Sonya Blade. And it keeps just getting stronger and stronger every year. You guys, the fan base is amazing. And I, you guys are all just immortal, I swear. And we all really appreciate that, keeping it alive. And I, th- I think that is what is probably most striking to me about the Mortal Kombat fan base, as you're speaking, Carrie. It's, it's strong and just how much it connects over the shared experiences, as, as you mentioned as well, Sal. And I think, being that this is a shared experience, I would love for anyone that could share, how does it feel to be linking up in this moment, all of you coming together in this reunion? I mean, obviously we're doing it for such a wonderful cause, the Ray and Science Foundation, but how does it feel for all of you four to be here on the same stage in the same room, making this once in a lifetime reunion happen? It feels like family. All these guys that we've known for years and years online, we don't know their face, we don't know their names, we know their ats. <laughs> so they introduce, they come up to us and they introduce us themselves to us and we're like, what's your at? Oh, okay, yeah, you're, you're that guy or that girl. So it, it's great. We feel like family. That's amazing. I love that. I assume that's probably a shared sentiment from everyone here. And that's family. Family. It's a friendship. <laughs> ah, I see what you did there. So the four of you, like we said, you guys created the original Mortal Kombat, like the original trilogy. Working on Mortal Kombat in all these various capacities, you must have faced several different highs and lows. Do you have any particular memories or experiences you could share from uh, your development time? Yeah, highs and lows. I, my memory of it was mostly just in the studio as we were recording. John and Ed they had put together a, a script that they wanted for the character and just trying to like, we just had a good time while we were coming up with ideas for the different things and just talking through it. And then, then their implementation of the actions that you capture there's nothing like, you don't know what it's going to be until they actually put it into the game. And once they put it into the game, it's like, oh my God, that's what you did with that, that pose I was on. And it's like, so when I see that stuff, I'm like elated. As a game developer, I'm elated with just like how great they can make something look from almost nothing. So that's the way I think about it. Yeah, please. So sitting next to Carrie and Sal. The one thing about Carrie and Sal when we were doing the digitizing way back when was they were both very physically capable of doing the moves and the motion. And one thing I remember about the both of them was that they were very good on the treadmill. I remember Carrie and Sal both had a good cadence with their run. And that was very important because other folks were not so good on the treadmill. They would stumble around a little bit, but they were both fantastic. And, and they both would throw themselves around. I remember on the mats, they were game for anything that we asked them to do. And then even when we weren't taping, just if we would get together like socially or whatever, you know, after the tapings or whatnot, they would still just beat the hell out of each other. Carrie constantly throwing Sal around left and right, and it was a lot of fun. Sal was a brother I never wanted. Uh, yeah, the, the highs would probably be when we were t- testing the first game and seeing a big crowd of people around it getting just that visceral reaction to seeing things for the first time. The lows would probably be, you know, we've had, in those days, we worked really crazy hours. You basically just dedicated your life to the game. You woke up, you went right into work, or you woke up at work, and you just worked through the whole thing. But that was how we were doing the games. But it was draining for all of us. But at the end of the day, when, you know, you're, you're in a group like this, you forget about all that and you just think about the, the win. So huge sacrifice, huge personal sacrifice. You know, I think, you know, we've all had summers that were just blown because we were working so hard. These but, guys would have couches in their offices and exactly. the couches are for taking naps. Absolutely. And so the sacrifice was extreme, but then when we would see reactions, and we would see, you know, movies being made and, and animated features and comic books and all that stuff. That would, that really made up for those lows. You know, that just reminded me of something. So 
when I think of highs, because uh, I get asked a lot about, you know, when did it, when did we know, you know, when did we know that, that MK was going to be a success and whatnot? And I think about the first time we tested, it was our first weekend test. And the way we tested coin op games back at Midway was we would do a prototype in just a plain black cabinet. And I think the first Mortal Kombat game, we did like a Xerox copy marquee. And we tested at a, an arcade in Chicago called Times Square. And I remember they wheeled the game in and it was just a plain black cabinet. And it was a Friday, so it was probably packed. And I remember them turning it on. Maybe it was Al Lasco. I forget who, who rolled the machine into the, into the uh, arcade. And all I remember was there was a Street Fighter machine just down the way, like, you know, several games uh, over, and a pack of players around it. And I just remember thinking, what, what are we doing here? It's like, how are we going to compete with this game? Look, it's just got this crowd. And so they turned the machine on him. There it sat alone with nobody playing it. And I thought, oh, we're, you know, we're dead. We're, we're not going to do well. And then I remember the first player walked over, put a, put a token in, played the game, and then ran over and tapped his friend on the shoulder and like told him about this game. And then he went over and then they were both playing it. And then slowly everybody migrated over. And at some point on that Friday night, we saw the crowd had migrated from Street Fighter over to MK. And that's when we realized we have, there's got to be something special about this game. We felt that during development. We felt that there was something special. People around the office were excited about it. But it was that first night, I think we understood that there was something special about the game. And that same weekend, we would see you, you recognize a face. And it was somebody who came in there on a Friday night. We saw them Saturday morning. They stayed the whole day. We saw them Sunday morning. They stayed the whole night. And then when they took the game away, the arcade was saying that they were getting phone calls. When are you going to bring this Mortal Kombat game back into the arcade? And it just spread like wildfire. We got calls from New York. Our distributors were saying, what is this new game you're testing? I think at that point, we knew when we, somebody would do a fatality and somebody's so excited that they just have to physically run around just to get it out of their system that we, we really knew something was hitting at that point. Yeah, and still, you guys, I remember watching the games. Whenever we watched a game that we put on test, uh, just watching people's reactions and seeing where their eyes lit up or, or where, and sometimes worse, is where they were confused about something. It's like, oh, how do you do this one thing? I don't get this. And so wh while we were watching games on test, we would notate that and then go back to the office sometimes that very night and like make fixes like, okay, they got confused. What's that? So yeah, we'd burn, we'd burn the updates at that point. It was hard to actually create ROMs that we would put into the machines. And then we'd run back the next night, plug in the updates that we made the night before and see if that corrected the confusion that we saw. We would study people playing it and we weren't allowed to interfere either. But the funny thing about it was at the time, we were young enough that we could blend in with the crowd of players. So people didn't realize that we were the actual developers and they thought we were just players standing in line waiting to play the game. But it was great because we got to observe their behaviors and yeah. we could study what they were doing without them understanding yeah. who we were. Yeah, we couldn't, we definitely couldn't do that now. Right. Or we get over, maybe Terry would, but I don't think the three of us can get away with it. Honestly, I think what I want to say thank you for, because I missed this and I don't know, maybe Phantom, you do, the quarter on the cabinet, winner stays mentality. That to me is something that I, I wish the kids nowadays would have, but it just doesn't exist. But it's just, it's that same feeling that you mentioned, Sal, of that connected tissue of people coming together. Phantom, do you remember that stuff too? Yeah, you know, the uh, the whole getting to play with your friends, even the Super Nintendo versions, getting to sit around and kind of interact with each other. The fact that you were there seeing this happen, how did the player feedback kind of determine how you were going to advance the game? Well, from our standpoint, it was just six characters. So I, I, I do think that we felt like we needed more in there. So we pulled the back game back in and we added the character and we had no female characters in the game. So we added the Sonya character into the game. And I think it gave us the confidence to say, let's, let's bet a little bit more on this game. Oh, that's right. So that reminds me, when we did our first weekend test, it was just the six characters minus Sonya. And then I think we saw it got such a good reaction that our management gave us more time to work on the game. So we got to fine tune the game. We got to add an additional character and then we re-released the game. I think we did a longer test, like a week test, maybe a couple months later. Yeah. I think what's so definable about the Mortal Kombat experience too is that the characters are so rich and you connect to them. And I would love to know from Carrie and Sal, 
How does that like come into your creation of the characters, knowing that just the way that they present themselves in this motion capture game that's ahead of its time? How do you take that on as a performer, as an actor, as a motion capture artist? How did that process come together for you? Yeah, that inspires your performance. You see the concepts, you hear about what the character is about, and then you present a persona that's based on that. And you try to add your own spice to it. And then sometimes you go too far. It's like, yeah, don't, don't do that. Yeah, whatever you're doing right now, stop that. And then you're okay, sorry. This character is more about this. And then, so we would do things. But again, it's like I attribute everything to the developers, the designers that have been worked hard thinking about it, worked hard about how this character works and fits into the whole scheme of, of, of the different, the suite of different characters, the movesets and all of that. But as far as like the, the character acting, for me anyway, it's like compared to making the game, you know, it's work, but compared to making the game, it's just a small, it's a small part of it. You know, the, the two of you actually, did you have any martial arts experience? So, Carrie, I believe you might have had some when you first started the games. Yeah, I was like a yellow belt. I had no idea. I, I was like a, a copycat, you know, even with my first game, NBA Jam, I didn't know how to cheerlead. I was the art student who, you know, wore the hoodie and, you know, <laughs> kept to herself during lunch. I would skip lunches just so I didn't have to socialize. That was me too, to be fair. I'm not right, right there with you. Yeah. So um, not much martial art experience, but I was a gymnast and I had some boxing and wrestling experience. So that helped me a lot. So I think Carlos was on the side and I was just copying whatever he did. But Sal had more insider information than I did. I... I was an outsider coming in. I had no idea what Mortal Kombat was. I did a couple more video games before Mortal Kombat 3 came on. And the time that I actually realized that it was big is when I went on tour. And we would finish a show. I would come out and there would just be these hordes of children wanting my autograph. You know, sticking, you know papers in front of my face or the plague or, or the programs or whatever wanting it and I would stay there and sign every single book until all those kids were gone because I thought this is temporary you know I'm never ever going to have this experience again in my life so I'm going to relish it and here I am 30 years later still doing the same thing <laughs> and I, I never had motion I never had a lot of of real martial arts training I watched the hell out of Bruce Lee though Bruce Lee, Steven Seagal, uh, Claude Van Damme, and I would just imitate them, like, like to every effect, all their poses, all that. But I never had the discipline to actually go to a real martial arts school and do the real work and the real thing. And I watched pro wrestling a lot, so I threw a little bit of that in there as well. I think both, both of you were very, again, I mentioned earlier, very physically capable of doing anything that we asked you to do, right? So it was, I think you were able to mimic a lot. Like we'd show you, Hey, we want you to do something like this. And you guys would just mimic it. Yes. Oh, and I had already practiced that stuff, you know, for 20 years before that, just pretending like I was Bruce Lee. So right, yeah, right. and, and John claude yeah, I, I got a rude awakening when I went on tour because I was the yellow belt coming in with these 20 black belts who were going on tour with me. And they wanted me because I was the character in the video game. And I did the promo work and all that stuff be before each show. So I had 20 black belts acting like my big brother, kicking my ass. Every single day, they resented me. They hated me. They didn't want me to be on tour with them. So I had to show up every day. We worked for three months in the Catskill Mountains for 12 hours a day. I was hallucinating. I was so tired. But I got through it, and it was it was really great training. This was for Mortal Kombat Live Tour that, that was produced in the mid-'90s. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, the one thing I would say about watching movie stars do their martial arts versus real martial artists is that movie stars sell for the camera. They don't fight for real. Like when you see what they're doing, nobody would ever do that. Like in an MMA match, you'd never see the stuff that they, well, nowadays you kind of do, but you'd never really see that. And it's because they're selling for the camera. Whereas a lot of classically trained and officially trained martial artists, they don't know how to sell because they're doing things practically. They're doing things very like, this is how you would uh, legitimately do this action, but it doesn't sell sometimes. So I think that's how I'm going to justify my part in that. Yeah. I mean, it's carry to a point you made before. I, I get it. Like the fake it till you make it kind of situation discovering all, as my acting coaches used to say, 
the best actors are the best thieves, right? No one knows that you're stealing something. And I appreciate as well, Sal, the whole wrestling. If, if I was a Mortal Kombat character, I think I'd be like Stone Cold Steve Austin, right? I think I'd be like Stryker, one of the average people who got mixed into it all. Like, it happens. <laughs> so, Ed and John, every sequel to Mortal Kombat, from the original all the way up, you just kept making advancement after advancement, even up to the, the current releases. What was the approach to Mortal Kombat 3 as a follow-up? Like, what was your overall mindset in comparison? Because Mortal Kombat 2 was a game-changer. Like, that became so big. But then what kind of incentivized you to keep going with Mortal Kombat 3 and make it what it did? Yeah, that was my absolute favorite, personally. I loved MK3. We didn't want to just repeat the last game. You know, Mortal Kombat 2 was such a significant jump forward in terms of the visuals, um, you know, it played better. You know, everything we learned from the first game, we applied to Mortal Kombat 2. And I think it would have been safe. And we probably could have gotten away with just making Mortal Kombat 2.5 and calling it Mortal Kombat 3. But we wanted to mix things up. So we added a run button and whatnot. And, and at first, the response was, you know, there was a resistance to it. It was kind of like, you know, this is not like the, the game that I played. But after a while, pl players started really getting into the aggressive nature of it. And as far as competitive-wise, like if you say which game is the most competitive, I think Ultimate MK3 is more competitive than Mortal Kombat 2, even though Mortal Kombat 2, it was such a big leap from, from MK1 to MK2. Again, the visuals, I thought, were just such a significant jump forward in MK2. Yeah, and I remember back then, the, the visual change okay, was so strong in MK from MK2 to MK1 that I remember when you're talking about MK3 you're like how do we top this I remember you guys having this conversation and then you guys started talking about things like adding novel modes like even the uppercut that went through the area above and then landed in a different level now and you're playing on a different level and then the run button like you said so I remember you guys were always trying to come up with these novel new things that would up the game you can't just visually it's like you were we were like peaked out visually for that tech. And that all stuck to my head as a developer. Sure. You know, one thing uh, I remember about the transition from MK1 to 2 was MK1, we were working on such a compressed schedule that we had to make tough choices about how we were going to produce the digitized graphics that you saw in the game. I had just come from a couple of games that I had worked on where there was very heavy, like everything was pretty much hand-drawn and animated. And I think we realized pretty quickly that there's just not enough time to touch every pixel, which is what would have been required. And so we really, on the first Mortal Kombat, just kind of gave in to the raw nature of the digitized graphics. And then when it came time to MK2, we had a little bit more time, more oh, artists, right? We added yeah, Tony Goski had joined the team. And so we had, because of the more time, I think we were able to kind of fine tune our approach to the visual qualities of what we had produced. And I think similar with MK3, I think by the time MK3 had come out, some of the what you see in the background environments were produced in 3D, 3D yeah. right? So we did some modeling there. The methods that we used to produce the digitized graphics had been so fine-tuned. We had custom development tools that were created for us to utilize to create, you know, to work with digitized sprites. So it really, the process was streamlined, and I think you kind of saw it in the quality level of what we were doing. The one thing about MK3 that I remember being upset about in the beginning was Ed decided to add the running. It was, it was Ed's idea. And so we kind of talked about it, and I remember Ed breaking the news to me. I, you know, like, I have this great idea. We're going to add this run button, and this is what it's going to do. But we got to make the character smaller. <laughs> and I was so upset by it. Wait, what do you mean smaller? They're supposed to get bigger. But we ended up making the characters just slightly smaller. I don't know, by 5, 10 pixels or something smaller. But it ended up working out really well, because I think the run button just kind of changed the aggressive nature of kind of how you, how you, how you yeah. play the game. Yeah, I think that also influenced a lot of fighting games as an overall. If I could use a pronoun to describe the Mortal Kombat franchise, innovation would be what that is. Not just with acting or run buttons or all the things in between. It is the full package that makes an innovative game. Innovative and visceral, I would say. Visceral is a good word there. But those things, both innovative and visceral, well, it draws attention. And as... Mortal Kombat, it fits into the larger tapestry of the history of video games. And I like to draw us to 1994 and their congressional hearings as, you know, the shades of how does the game industry answer to the American government? Uh, and you're seeing these congressional hearings come out. If anyone could speak to 
what that meant to them. This is such a pivotal moment in time, the creation of the ESRB. Can anyone speak to this moment in time? I think we were looking at it from the standpoint of video games were getting more and more sophisticated and, you know, the record industry had a label for, you know, explicit lyrics or something. Movies forever had rated R, rated PG, PG-13 and all that. Even television had ratings and video games was kind of like the last one to kind of jump onto the bandwagon. So. By no means when we were making the first game were we thinking, you know, I, you know, I can't wait for a six-year-old to play this game. You know, nobody, nobody was thinking that. At, 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 at some point, we realized that some of the ratings was necessary, and it was something that we agreed with. You know, once Mortal Kombat 2 came out and it had the M rating on it, everybody was kind of like on board with the ESRB. From our perspective the objection died down. It was just like, oh, this is an R-rated movie. This is something. You know, the one thing about video games at the time, this is, you know, early, mid-90s, I think when, when this all started to kind of come about, is that video games back then were kind of thought of as toys. You know, toys for kids. And I think that the realization was, was happening that these kids who were playing games, they're not stopping. Like I was still playing, oh, I was a developer, but I was still playing games. But my friends were all still playing games and they're now in their 20s. And I think there was the realization that games aren't this thing created for kids. Games are there for all ages, just like film and television. There's content and media created for people of all ages. And different games appeal to different age groups. I think games, I think now, of course, are very different from what they were back then. But back then, especially coming out of the 80s, there was, of course, there was the coin out market, but I think the, the, especially the home console market was thought of as these things are being produced for kids. And that was changing in the nineties. It was changing because no one, no one stopped. I didn't stop. I'm sure a bunch of folks out in the crowd, you didn't stop playing video games. Everybody just kept playing. So, um, that was a, that was a, a change that kind of occurred at that point in time. When all this was occurring, we had friendships and then there was also the Bay Balladies. Was this a direct response to that type of drama that was happening, or was it just one more variation you wanted to add to the game? I do remember having a conversation with John about it, and, you know, I think, I, I shouldn't speak for John, but I think in, in my head, we were kind of making a statement of it's not just the violent aspect, but it's also the secret aspect. How do you do Liu Kang's friendship move? How do you do Shang Tsung's friendship move? And it fell in the same category as a fatality move or an animality after uh, MK3. And we were just kind of saying, look, we can do something really stupid and it'll still be fun. It's not just the violent part of it. Definitely fun. And it, it, I love the secret element of that because I remember spending hours trying to master getting those combinations and the satisfaction of being able to figure that out. It's great. And I, I also want to address this question, Carrie, to you. As I, the legacy of Sonya Blade, it continues to inspire fans to this day. How do you see the legacy of that character and your involvement with that character continue to develop in the world and how Sonya Blade and how she's affected you? Oh, my gosh. She's affected me quite a bit in my life. She was a very strong female character. And when I was on tour, I could see all these little girls looking up to me. I would get letters from girls saying, I want to be just like you. And it would inspire me more to be stronger and, and learn how to fight and, and all that stuff. And as I grew and I became a mom myself and I had my own children, my two twins that I had first were severely disabled. So it kind of gave me that inner strength to keep going and not complain. You know, life is life. You, you, you handle it whatever it gives to you, you handle it and stay positive, you know, and I, I don't want to sit here and preach and stuff, but, um, it, she really did inspire me to stay strong. And I think that's why I haven't let her go. And I think that I still embrace it. It's just a part of me now. She's just a part of me. I think inspiration is definitely a large part of the legacy of Sonia Blade. I think we can agree. Can we everybody? Yeah, definitely. And you know, I like to just take this moment just to reflect back on the Radiant Science Foundation since we're up here and we're talking about this. The fact that Sonya Blade inspired so many was kind of the same story as, as Raiden. So 
if you hadn't had the chance yet, please go check out that booth. Certainly. And let's let's open up a question to, uh, I think would affect anybody in, that's involved in the franchise. Uh, looking back at it, what are you most proud of in the Mortal Kombat franchise, both in terms of creation, influence, maybe character development, or taking on those roles? What do you look back at and you say, if I'm going to hang my hat on that one thing that I am so proud of that I did that, what would that be? For me, it was just the fact that it's still around after 30, what year is this? 32 years. Time yeah, is funny. Yeah, and you know, to me, it was a sweet spot of technology, digitized characters. People don't realize just how big the lore of Mortal Kombat was. The first game was just little paragraphs of the characters, but they just, players just attached themselves to, you know, Liu Kang's my guy, or Raiden's my guy, or Sonya's my girl. I really think that that plays such a significant role in Mortal Kombat's success. It was not only this crazy, really fast-paced, violent, visually different than anything, but these characters, to this day, they're making a movie about Scorpion and his rivalry with Sub-Zero in the Netherrealm and all that stuff. They're still doing it to this day. And I think that it's not just... The visuals, what the character looks like, what the cool stuff the characters do, and the story behind them. I think that's a significant part of its longevity from my Yeah, I would say very similar to Ed. You know, the one thing that when I think back on the creation of especially the first game in hindsight and the conditions that we created it under, the one thing about MK, again, you can look at it in hindsight, and I've expressed this before, is that game and what it kind of became in those, you know, in the, back in the early games really was a conglomeration of kind of who Ed and I were at the time and the things we grew up loving and, and everything that made us who we were at the time. We just threw it all at Mortal Kombat. And people always point out they can see a little bit of this book or this character or this film or this song or whatever in the game. And that really is because we, we literally just took everything about who we were at the time and put it into this game best we could. And it really was kind of a, an expression of who we were at the time. And that just, the fact that that resonated the way that it did really is we're very lucky that it happened, you know, the way that it did. But uh, I'm very proud that it really was very organic. Like it wasn't, you know, so there was a lot of planning, a lot of hard work in it that, you know, that we put into it. But the fact that we really just took these things that we loved and tried to weave it together and express it through that game worked out the way that it did. I'm very proud of that. I think we we're very fortunate that it happened the way that it did. But again, in hindsight, looking back at it, it really was a kind of a pure expression of, of who we were and the things that we consumed as kids even growing up. So, Yeah, and as a developer, like working next to you guys, I remember just kind of watching from afar the principles that you guys used when executing on stuff, like implementing stuff. We talk about all the time, like when and the visceral feelings that you guys talk about and get, like there's a way of doing that, that not everybody does, which is why not every game has it, but there are principles that are employed, like when somebody gets hit, firstly, the, the pose, the posturing of it, you know, the, then the impact point, the camera will shake, the player will move a certain way, the audio happens a certain way, at the right level, the right type of audio happens, the right type of effect happens off of them. And all of those things together, I think are, are things that not everybody does. And if you do it right, that's where you go. Like, that's the difference between like when you go see a Marvel movie versus like a, you know, some, you know, low budget movie, there's principles that they're using that make you go, Oh, that sell what's happening. And that was happening all throughout the Mortal Kombat creation. And I took a lot of that stuff into my wrestling games, into the games that I did in the future, where it was a similar type of thing. And, and I think you guys should be proud of that, of having the foresight or at least the knowledge base to say, yeah, we should do this to sell it better. We should do this to make this feel, or you know what, scrap this. We don't like this. This isn't working out. Let's do something else altogether. Yeah, it was funny because the one thing about the games that we did at Midway back in the day, you know, we produced them in these point-op cabinets that had actually a really good sound system. Yeah. And if you crank the audio, you'd hear the thunder of the bass. And I remember I had worked on a game called Smash TV, and you'd walk into an arcade, and you'd hear the rumble of all the explosions and the shooting and stuff yeah. that, that had an effect. And then MK was similar. You know, Ed kind of calling Dan Ford and the, the sounds that he did, but the sound of the uppercut yeah. was the most, it was like a calling card. You'd walk into an arcade, and you'd hear the 
boom, uh, the uppercut. Yeah, and that was, like that. That, was, yeah. that was pretty cool. Yeah. 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 I want to see a show of hands. Like, Mortal Kombat has changed a lot of people's lives. It's inspired them. It's made them healthy. It's done all these things. How many of you have played this game as a young kid and it you decided that this changed your life for the better? Right there. Right there. That's that's what we can hang our hat on. Carrie, that was goosebumps inducing. I felt that. Yeah. Did you feel that? Oh yeah. <laughs> Mortal Kombat One Chaos Reigns about to release. And we've seen this franchise just continue to grow year after year. What do you hope to see in the future of the franchise? I, I, to me, there's two kind of directions. One is I do think we need to continue moving forward with new content, but there's a catalog of 30 years of games and a lot of high points in people's memories, right? You know, Shaolin Monks, you know, Deception Conquest, you know, all of these um, kind of pivotal moments. Some people entered, you know, the Mortal Kombat, like I think some people here are probably born after the first game came out. And so a lot of people have kind of onboarded into Mortal Kombat. So I do see us, you know, I would love it if we could like kind of revisit some of those moments with the latest technology and, and you know, remasters and, and you know, a, another action adventure game and all that stuff like that. I really feel like there's great opportunities for that. Well, you got some good direct feedback there, Ed. No objection. Anyone else, any insights on what you'd like to see out of the future? Um, I mean, you gave us a good one, so we'll take that. I, I'd like to see Sonya Blade come back. Oh, yeah, I think... Yeah, you're 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 not you're never gonna see her again. No, she she clearly will make a a return to Mortal Kombat. I'm always happy to see Noob Cybot come back because I think a lot of times I don't know that anybody would understand even who I am or what my relationship to the series is if they didn't keep bringing that character back. So I'm very happy yeah, yeah. to see him come back. In the past we we've seen Christopher Lambert, we've seen a lot of the original movie actors. Any chance we might see some of the digitized actors make an appearance in Mortal Kombat? Yeah, we, we, we've definitely talked about that. <laughs> Unfortunately, Carrie's very expensive, and we we can't afford her at the, at the time at the moment. But no, no, we've we've had some great uh, like kind of like movie skins and guest characters. You know, Jean Claude Van Damme as Johnny Cage and whatnot. But we we've definitely had conversations about bringing the classic arcade actors scanning their faces and getting all that into the game that would be really cool who else would like to see that you know i love these panels we get such great direct feedback it's awesome yeah they're right there clapping i love it uh speaking of direct feedback you know i would love to see if we have any questions from the audience i've got my co MC right over here molly gannon she's been uh working ever so diligently with yanni yanni what's up man is there any question or two from the audience that we'd love to throw to the panelists? Oh, yeah. We got a ton of questions over here. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. They're excited. They've got tons of great questions. Are you ready for them? You know, I think we have time for one or two. All right. Awesome. First, we all just want to say thank you so much, seriously, for making such a big impact on our lives. Thank you. Seriously. We've got a beautiful question right here from Hendrik. He says, which character just blows your mind that got so popular and so legendary that maybe you weren't expecting it? Maybe Cabal. <laughs> because I always, I wasn't, at, in the initial creation of Cabal, I wasn't very happy with him visually, the visual qualities of Cabal. Fortunately, Ed, I think you, it was your idea to make, give him super speed, kind of like the Flash. Ed has always been a big fan of the Flash. So he was a, a fun, playable character in MK3. But they brought him back like in the new film. And it's like he's lived this life that I never had anticipated it, you know, that we'd still be talking about Cabal all these years later. So very happy about him. All right. We have a question from Sam. Have you considered a modern take on the photo captured style from the original Mortal Kombat? Actually, there was a project that got started that had much higher resolution. I think they were 3D models, but they certainly looked like photorealistic versions of the character. And it was like kind of re remakes of the of the classic arcade games. They've started and unfortunately hit 
snags that I'm not allowed to really discuss, but they stalled them. But that's certainly something that's always on our minds is to someday bring back a Mortal Kombat 2 or Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 in today's technology. One day the stars are going to align and we'll make that happen. That's great because you've actually answered multiple questions in one with that. Oh, so we got a, a few more if that's all right. I mean, honestly, those are two great questions, Phantom. I think we should get a few more of them out there. You've got a great audience here. Let's keep it going. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Thank you guys for your questions. We've got Neji says for Ed, uh, how does designing current Mortal Kombat games now compare to how it was in the beginning? Is it tougher creating the game now that you're creating it for a more competitive or, or a more casual player? It certainly doesn't take any less time from me personally, just because when we made the first Mortal Kombat game, it was four of us, me, John, Dan Forden, and John Vogel. And we did it in eight months from beginning to end. Now the games are two plus years, three years long. There's hundreds of people who work on it, different studios. It's much more different than it is difficult. What we were doing was a lot more, I guess, establishing the franchise and, and really kind of set the foundation. And the new games are much bigger in production. The story is much more, there's a whole group that's just doing the story mode. So it's different. It's just, you know, I, I used to be the only programmer on the team and I, I haven't written code in 20 years, something like that. So it's, a, it's just a very different, different uh, experience. You no applause. No, no <laughs> applause for that. Or... All right. All right. All right. No, please, please, no, no. <laughs> but keep going, but keep going. Yanni, do you got a question for us? We do, from Evil Emperor X. Ed, you okay, once Okay, great said, name, first off. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he is the meme machine on Mortal Kombat Twitter. You once said, Ed, that Quan Chi's leg rip was your favorite fatality and that his next stretch was your least favorite. Now, have you or anybody in the rest of the group developed any new favorite or least favorite fatalities? Yeah, the leg rip, and that was actually our CEO at the time, Neil Nicastro, came up with that stupid idea. And I don't know if I ever said it was my favorite, but the next stretch is just plain old embarrassing for me. Very coincidentally, that's what we always ask at the other Rome cast, too. So I'm very eager to hear what each of your favorite finisher or fatality would be. I think I answer this different. I get asked this question a lot, and I probably answer it different all the time. It would either be Kano's heart rip or Sub-Zero's neck rip from the first game. Because those, I remember when we tested the game back then, seemed to get the biggest reaction. Yeah, the, the spine rip was John's idea. And I do remember saying to him, no, there's no way we can get away with that. You know, like, like it was from Predator and all that stuff. I think it's arguably the most iconic one that's shown on TV that kind of defines Mortal Kombat. It's my favorite as well, the spine rip. Great answer. Mine's the kiss of death, of course. I mean... You how do you argue with that? I I'm partial to the reptile eats the person in the three parts. Oh, when he takes off the mask and yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I think we have time uh, maybe for two more Q&A questions. Awesome. Well, kind of on that same note, we have a question from Jessica. She says, what is the worst fatality cutout scene that has ever been pitched to you? You know, I remember back in the, uh, I don't remember whether it was MK2. I think it was MK2. Uh, we were... Uh, I, I had actually done some animations of guts spilling out. Uh, Baraka was going to slice a guy in the midsection, and then the, the guts were going to spill out onto the floor or whatever. And I think we were like, eh, we can't... It was like we pushed it, we were pushing... We felt like we were pushing it too far back then, but that was one that we opted to self-edit. No one ever and, told and us it's, no. And it's like anything. nothing now. It's like our, our more mild... Right, compared to the new thing. games. Yeah, it's nothing. All right, and this question comes from Anonymous. What has been the difference between MK95 and MK2021 regarding yourself or the studio's official involvement? In MK MK95, John and I actually went onto the set. We flew to California, and I don't think we really steered the script much, did we? Did we? Uh... We did. Well, we did get versions of the script, and I know we put, compiled notes and shared notes with Larry. Did they do anything about it, or I think maybe they did early on. It was very early on. Oh, right, the Kano eye patch. And, right. Yeah. And, it was all right, kinds right, of stuff. Yeah, right, they had. That's right. Yeah, right. In the early, in the first MK film, they were testing versions. I remember this versions of our characters that look nothing like yeah. their versions yeah. in the game. And I guess they did some focus testing and, and the players fortunately reacted negatively to the changing of the characters. They're like, well, that's not Scorpion and that's not 
Kano. Um, and so they made them look more like the characters from the game. The, the, and then, and the, the new, the, the 2021 one was, um, I think I saw a script, but it was very late into the production and there wasn't really much room to, to, to make modifications or change things, whatnot. All right. So, I mean, with that, we're coming pretty close to a close here. This has been an amazing experience here. It really has. And Carrie, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but would you feel comfortable showing everybody? I was surprised to learn recently that your friendship dance was not just some digitized sprite thing, but it's actually a dance you can do. Would you feel comfortable doing that for the crowd? Oh, my God. Oh, it was the arm. It was not a dance. It was me waiting for them to reboot the computer and just goofing off. The, the camera was still rolling and the computers would crash because they didn't have enough RAM because these, you know, we were doing pioneer stuff, you know, and the computers couldn't keep up with it. So there's me waiting. And then they made up my friendship. Talents. Talents. Was- <laughs> Thank you so much, Carrie. That's great. I love just how much it really has come out that you truly are not just a family with each other, but all this great audience coming out here. And I think that we just have to say a big thank you to each and every one of you for coming, not just to the show, but anyway, this reunion panel here today. So thank you, truly. I'm going to have all of us this here. This has been so fun. I've had a great time meeting everyone, like even playing against a bunch of people who I beat every single one of, right? Right? It's, yeah, it was great. That's time. the story, and we're sticking to it, right? The reason that us four are here is because of little Raiden over there. So to say thanks, go over there and donate. Five bucks, whatever, just something. Everything counts. You know, we are trying to find a cure for UBA5, and... You know, it grabs my heart. This little boy, he reminds me so much of my own sons, but my own sons don't have a death sentence. But right now, Raiden does. So if you guys can go over there and donate, you know, whatever you can afford, we all appreciate it. We want this little boy to live because he's an amazing little boy. He really is. I just got to meet him. And what a wonderful spirit Raiden has. And it's the God of Thunder that's all propelling us forward to make a difference in the fights. But I, I think there's only one last thing that we can do. Ed, would you mind terribly? Get over here! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please get to your feet and give a massive round of applause to our amazing Mortal Kombat panelists here. Thank you, everybody. So I hope you guys enjoyed the panel and enjoyed the questions that we were able to ask. But that's not all. We also have an exclusive interview while John Tobias is sitting down and drawing. That's coming up. But before we go into that, we have one more little segment. So in this next segment, we got to actually sit down and talk with the founder of the Raiden Science Foundation, Tommy. Great guy. And he was able to sort of just take us through exactly what the whole foundation was about, what the point of it was, and sort of give us some details that maybe people who might be aware of the actual actual foundation itself might not be aware of in greater detail. So it was really cool to hear all this from him and definitely check that out. Yep. So we're going into that next. And if you're interested in donating to the cause, we will leave links in the description of our show where you can donate to the Radio Science Foundation. Uh, But be sure to stick around because after that, we're going straight into the John Tobias drawing session. All right. So we are here at CGC Cleveland Gaming Classics with Tommy Pham from the Radio Science Foundation. Tommy, how does it feel to see all of this come together into the Cure for Rare? I am super speechless, not only to be at a convention and raising awareness and fundraising for UBA5 disorder and rare diseases, and half of my family here have been raiding here for the first time, my son, which has never happened, this is the first time. Seeing the Cleveland Gaming Classic community come out, it's just so amazing when I was on stage. And you guys and all the MK community coming out to support us, dude, literally, I'm speechless. I can't find the right word to describe it. Just know I'm grateful. Well, we are so honored to be here and to participate in this and help you raise as much money as possible. Uh, to any of our fans that are out there who want to donate to the Radiant Science Foundation, 
please make sure to do that. We're going to actually leave links in the description of our show. So how do you think the event's gone? How's it been with the whole community? Do you feel like the community has been able to come together in such a way where you've been able to spread more awareness? Absolutely. We're spreading awareness not only our local like MK community, not only it's like within the States, the US, it's like global as well from where we started. When I first started Combat for Real, it was two years ago, October 30th, right? And from where it was to where it's now and the evolution of it and just, yeah, Yes, everybody around the world coming to support us. It just grew within two years organically. So you said combat for rare, fight for rare. Tell people exactly what, what, what is Raiden Science Foundation? So simply put, the Raiden Science Foundation, our mission is to harness the power of community to develop cures for rare disease, starting with UBA5 disorder. UBA5 disorder is a condition that my son has. His name is Raiden, named after the God of Thunder. Think about UBA5 disorder as cerebral palsy. He doesn't have any motor control. He can't control his body. His mind is maybe at an age of like a six month old and we feed him via a tube. This condition is progressive. It gets worse over time until your body and brain deteriorate. And so through the Raiden Science Foundation, not only are we raising awareness for rare diseases that impact kids, we are also raising against the clock to develop a treatment for this condition and show that the impossible is possible and we're on our way to doing it. When we first got the diagnosis, the doctor's like, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can really do with your son. Just enjoy your time because it's a progressive disorder. But we are changing our narrative. We'll work with UMass. We'll work with St. Jude's. We'll work with Baylor. We'll work with OHSU, um, Oregon Health and Science University, to create a treatment for this condition. Just because you got a diagnosis of a debilitating disorder doesn't mean it's the end game. There is possibility. We're out there fighting. So that's Together. The, together. It's all about the beauty. And that's the Radiant Science Foundation. And then we started Combat for Rare as part of the gaming initiative to tap into the Mortal Kombat community. A community that I've been a part of. I play ever since I was a kid. I fell in love with the character Raiden. Hence I named my son Raiden, the God of Thunder, not knowing that he had to like fight for his life. And yeah, it just, you know, it just all came about so organic, so natural that it's evolved and it just happened. If there's one word I could use for Fight for Rare, it is fight. And that's why it's such a perfect title for everything that you've been doing. How many years did you say you've been doing Fight for Rare so far? We started with Combat for Rare back in October 2022 as part of Mortal Kombat 30th anniversary. And as we evolved and we grew, we we're like, okay, it's beyond the Mortal Kombat community. First and foremost, it's about the Mortal Kombat community. Then it's about the fighting game community. Hence, we opened up to Fight for Rare instead of Combat for Rare. In the last two years, what's some of the progress that you've seen through the research and everything that you guys have been doing? When we first started, all we had was UMass Chain Medical School working on the research. Again, now we have UMass, we have St. Jude's, which is huge. St. Jude doesn't do research for rare disease. Normally you think about St. Jude's as childhood cancer. Now they're into rare disease, right? And we're lucky enough to have our disorder UBA5 being studied at St. Jude's. We have Baylor College of Medicine, and we have Oregon Health and Science University. We literally have a whole ecosystem to study UBA5 disorder. This matters because a lot of times when there's a newly discovered rare disease, there's nothing out there. There's no research, no treatment, like good luck. There's no focus on any research to find treatment for this kind of stuff because it's so rare. So rare, right? And then within two years, we create a whole ecosystem that enable researchers to develop a treatment and test it from end to end before it gets into a child, in clinical trial, not to get scientific. But what we created, if I took a step back in the last two years or two years about, it's incredible. It's, it's amazing to see just how much progress has been, but what more can we all do together? Just keep raising awareness, keep bringing more people in the community to support our cause. There's how many millions of Mortal Kombat fans are out there? Well, a l way too many to count. <laughs> <laughs> if we can get all the Mortal Kombat fans to donate a buck each, we're able to accelerate our research much quicker. Again, one buck per Mortal Kombat fan. That's all it takes. Well, you definitely had some big names come out to this event. Ed Boone, John Tobias, Kerry Hoskins, Sal DeVita, all of them were here for this event. I'm curious, what is next for your fundraising? What is next? Well, we have an upcoming stream at the end of October. It's our anniversary for Combat for Air. Now it's Fight for Air, so we'll do another charity stream. We'll continue to be at events and conventions like this all across the country to the best of our ability. At, at the end of the day, it's just me and my wife operating the foundation, but we hope to continue to scale and grow and to spread the message, spread the awareness, not only about Raiden UBA5, but all the rare genetic disease out there. Because when I mentioned on stage, there's 200 million kids 
affected by rare disease. I didn't say it up there because it's emotional. Out of 200 million kids, 30%, which is 60 million kids, will not see their fifth birthday. That's the reality of something like this. You, you don't have the research going on because it's, it's such rare diseases, but there are enough people suffering that we actually need to progress, not just with general treatment, but with specific treatment, which is why such fundraising is necessary. So how can people continue to support you? Where can they find you? Yeah, continue to follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Raiden Science. On Instagram, it's my son's journey, Raiden underscore journey. And on, on Twitter, we have our foundation page, which is Raiden Science. And then we have our Fight for Rare page, which is a Fight for Rare as well. And then most important, you can always keep up to date with everything going on with the foundation via RaidenScience.org. Well done. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, Thank you for sitting down with us, being able to share your story and the, the fundraising efforts with everybody, and hopefully the community can, can you, yeah. continue to come together. Thank you for the time and everything you guys have done for us. No, seriously, we appreciate it so much. So if you guys are interested in donating to the Raiden Science Foundation, be sure to click on the link. You'll find it in our show notes at realmcast.com, or if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, it'll be in the description of this video. Up next is Yanni's sit-down drawing session with John Tobias. So, I, I hope you guys enjoy this. I know I did. Well, Yanni, we had your amazing cohorts, Phantom, right over there. And I'll tell you, I have to say, we've been doing some great work for the Rain Science Foundation all along the way. Yeah, I think it's been great. It's been an amazing turnout. And I think the panel had some really cool questions, too, especially from the audience as well. It's nice to see everybody turn up in support of the Rain Science Foundation. And for all that support, I am so privileged to know that we are about to see something very special, something very unique. It's, it's an amazing opportunity to get to see John Tobias himself, the co-creator of Mortal Kombat, the, the original lore master behind Mortal Kombat. Welcome, John. Ladies and gentlemen, John, everyone. Let's give a big round of applause. John, yeah. thank you for joining us. Thanks for coming. I have never done this in my entire life have I drawn uh, anything in front of a group of people. So this is um, the first time experience for me as much as it is for all of you guys. I guess this is kind of a seminar, so I'll talk a little bit about maybe my tech, my drawing technique. I'll talk about the character that I'm drawing. Well, actually, I think we're going to keep that a secret. Yeah, let's keep it yeah. a secret, right? Yeah, let's keep it, it a secret. So you guys will figure it out as I draw. I think you'll figure it out pretty quickly while I'm drawing. Only true Mortal Kombat fans can figure this out, right? Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I think you just have to be sort of somewhat familiar with the, with the series I was talking about drawing, but you'll know it pretty quickly. Um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what I'm doing. Maybe I'll talk about the, the initial design on the original characters. One thing I, and I, I've spoken about this before, one thing about the original series is that there was a ceiling regarding the complexity of the designs. So the pixelization of the, the sprites on screen just meant that you couldn't do anything too detailed. And so because of that, I think that somewhat influenced the simplicity of the designs of the original characters, which I think was a good thing because kind of forced us to adhere to some uh, very basic design principles. So it's from something as simple as the triangular uh, shape of Raiden's hat to the V-shape of the, you know, the ninjas and their tunics. I think all that stuff I think led to sort of the um, the, uh, the iconic nature of what the characters became. So I think everything just kind of came together uh, almost by accident, but a lot of it was planning. So I'll start by drawing here. I don't know what characters can see. But uh, I'll start the drawing. Usually when I, and I learned this in life drawing class, Sal David and I would talk and tell more stories about going to art school. But the one thing that I typically do is a gesture. And usually it's, it helps kind of give the, even if you're doing just a stance, which is what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to try to replicate if anybody has seen the original character illustrations that I used to do, you saw them in all the magazines back in the 90s and stuff. I'm going to try to replicate uh, that book. But usually I start with kind of a gesture, and it's to make sure that the characters don't look too stiff even when they're standing. So I'll start with a gesture, usually just a, a simple shape. And I do a lot of erasing when I draw. But I'll start with a simple gesture. So this is going to be sort of the, the stance of the figure. I'll just do something simple like that, and then I'll get moving. So I'll start with simple shapes. It's going to be the head of the character. 
and uh, I scribble a lot when I draw, and my my line work tends to, when you see the finished product, it tends to be fairly clean. A lot of times I'll do my, my pencil drawing, and then I'll do, a, I'll work on a light box, and I'll put a piece of paper on top of it, and I'll draw with marker on top of that, and then I'll color on top of that. But here I'm just gonna do black and white, so I'll start with pencil, and then I'll, I'll ink it with my markers right. So here's my, start with my set figure shape. There we go. And uh, I'll usually just work my way down the body, and I just use that to direct the pose. Create. John, how do you go about designing characters from scratch? Like, what, what's the core aspects that you try to establish? You've mentioned, for example, Raiden's hat. Does that go into your mind before you start the drawing? Is it something you want to have that's iconic? Of course, yeah. Usually there's, we'll start with sort of a basic idea on who the character uh, is going to be. And a lot of times with their characters, it's a lot about the characterization of the character. And that'll sort of dictate the visual qualities that try to design with the character. But the MK characters kind of started that way. We had general ideas ideas on kind of what we thought uh, we wanted them to be, and then I just sort of worked it out with sketches. The first Mortal Kombat game, we did very little in terms of concept art, almost none. And in fact, if you see any drawings from the Mortal Kombat 1 characters, they were little scribbles I did in the notebook. And that was the extent of what we had done. And then we just put together costume pieces to kind of replicate the, the little scribbles that we did. In the later games, I think starting with MK2, we had costume uh, makers sort of develop the actual um, fabrics and the costumes that the characters this war. And so for that, I would actually do an illustration kind of like I'm doing here. But I usually drew on eight and a half by 11, like just copy paper. It's a lot ago. We didn't have scanners. And so but we had a copy machine and I like to color on the, the copies that we made. So everything I did was eight and a half by 11, which for me was really small because when I went to art school, I was used to working very large on large pieces of paper. This, even this is a little small for me. And actually prior to uh, working in games and even the in the comic book work that I did, I actually did graffiti art for a while. And you can imagine, Woo! when I did that, I spray painted on a giant walls. And so it was, I was used to working big. So over time, everything got smaller and smaller and smaller. And I was finally working on little eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. And for me, it was tiny. And you tend to tighten up when you're drawing that small. You use technical pencils and things like that. But I prefer to work large. I know we have an hour here, but I'll do my best to finish this drawing. So it'll start to come together. And I think you guys will be able to kind of guess who it is on. You're obviously mostly known for being a video game designer and writer because, you know, the, your co-creation with a little series called Mortal Kombat. But now, obviously, we have on display the fact that you're a comic book artist and a graphic designer, and you mentioned you, you, know, you were doing graffiti and such when you were younger. Where, where did that sort of desire stem from, become a comic book artist? I started drawing from my earliest memories. So I was probably three years old with a crayon drawing something. And one of my earliest inspirations was just part watching cartoons on TV. And I would draw the cartoons that I saw. Or I would draw movies that I saw. The Batman television series with Adam West, they used to play reruns of it. And I watched that a lot. And there were Spider-Man cartoons, the deal with Marvel cartoons. Those are my earliest inspirations, even before I started reading comic books. And that led to me reading comic books. And then, of course, wanting to be able to you was mentioning the legacy of the DC characters. Obviously, Mortal Kombat has a very strong connection to the DC universe with some crossovers. Do you think that some of that early inspiration between the comic book characters came to influence the way you designed the Mortal Kombat characters? Absolutely. Yeah, I think on the panel we talk about this a little bit. But I think everything I do and have created is just kind of a product of the things that I consume as a kid growing up. And and even the, 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 the style that I draw, I think was somewhat influenced by the comic book artists that I admired when I was a kid. And it inevitably comes back, even if it's not consciously, sometimes it's subconsciously, you know, these influences that, that sort of you experience just in the media that you consume. I think as you can You're saying you, know, you take that early influence and such, and it obviously helps shape your style. And we can see that in Mortal Kombat. You've got Big Trouble in Little China, Bruce Lee under the dragon, even I think Fu did the God of Wind, you know, sort of resembling Thor to an extent. Do you feel like you have taken those influences and tried to sort of adapt them in your own style and let them evolve in a way that's become a core identity of your, of your art style now? So yes, I think 
those influences, they, they weren't as direct as some people think. So the, even when we talk about Bruce Lee, uh, we talk about Big Trouble in Little China being influenced, the, there was the, the, char- the lightning character in that film. But those are more kind of afterthoughts for us. It was like there was the rated, the initial inspiration for rated actually came from a trip that I took to the Field Museum in Chicago. And I was actually doing a little bit of research for MK. And I had my camera. When we worked at Midway, we always carried our video cameras with us for videotape pictures and things. But anyway, there was a little stash there. It was a, a statue of Raiden, the God of Thunder, and it was quite different from the Raiden that we know. He was a little, he was kind of like a demon with drums on his back. That was the initial influence. And when I read that, I thought, first of all, I thought the name Raiden was cool. And I thought, oh my God, he's a God of Thunder. How do we not put that in our game? And then I, I probably talked to Ed about the idea. And at some point, we paid homage to the character Lightning. Was it Lightning or Wind? What was it called? Lightning, yeah, from Big Trouble in China. We're like, we gotta put this triangular shaped hat on the set. So it was more like being a lot of this movie that I saw, I think, in high school when that film came out. But that's that was the inspiration for using the hat. Of course, the moment we put the triangular hat on his head, the fact that he had lightning, everybody put two and two together and understood what the what the reference was. You know, I have to say right now, taking a look at the progress we're making on this drawing, I am I've got to take it away at how quickly and also just how detailed and gorgeous this is. Isn't this amazing? so far, everybody? Yeah. John, you, you mentioned movies, and I actually want to ask something I've been wanting to ask yesterday and today, because I really became attached to the Mortal Kombat franchise when it hit the big screen, the Mortal Kombat movie in 1995. I thought that was a great movie. I loved the way that I saw the characters that were on the video game and it kind of came to life. How, how must it, it felt for you to see those characters that you created Suddenly you appear on the big screen. That was, uh, that, well, the whole experience was surreal, you know, for me. And I think that, first of all, when the game became as popular as it did, that was a pleasant surprise. And of course, Ed and I were always so busy working on the next game, we had very little time to appreciate the effect that Mortal Kombat was having at, you know, in pop culture at the time. So we were kind of aware of, it, of its popularity, but we were, again, we were so busy working on the next iteration of the game that we didn't really have time to soak it up. So even when the film came out, I think it really, for me, wasn't until Ed and I had a chance to visit the set when they were filming and we got to meet the actors and such that we understood sort of the enormity of just the big set that they built and the production and everything was just, it was really surreal. And then, you know, the other thing I would say you know, for me, kind of in hindsight, that I appreciate now kind of more than ever is I remember when I was a little kid, I was talking to my uncle, one of my uncles, he, and I was always drawing when I was little, and I remember he asked me, what do you want? to draw or what do you want to do? And I said, oh, I want to draw a Spider-Man. I want to draw the Spider-Man comic book. And I said to me, somebody already created Spider-Man. He's like, you got to create something new. And I remember that kind of thinking about that at the time. So, oh, okay. I guess he's right. Somebody already did create Spider-Man. If I could go back in time and meet me when I was, you know, eight years old and say, hey, you know, by the way, you're going to create something that's going to inspire people. It's going to become its own thing. I wouldn't have believed it. I'm super blessed that I got to play a part in the creation of something I think that's resonated for you know, 30 years at this point. And I just, I, I'm super blessed by that. I think in hindsight, never did I think that I would create something that would have sort of this longevity. And I think this effect on other people. Yesterday I got to meet a bunch of fans and a few artists who talk about me inspiring them. And that's a big deal for me because I remember feeling the same way about the comic book artists that I had admired when I was an artist kind of growing up. And so that I think has a big effect. And that even today I think still I pinch myself when I think about being in a position like that. Do you feel like that advice from your uncle sort of stuck with you subconsciously to the point that you ended up creating Mortal Kombat? Maybe, because even when I was, I think when I was about that age, I actually illustrated comic books professionally for a couple of years before I started working in games. There was a cartoon called The Real Ghostbusters, and I illustrated yeah, the, the comic book adaptation of that for about a year and a half, and I used it to pay my way through college. Um, but even after that, when I, even when I started working at Midway, I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to work at Midway for a little bit. I'm going to save money, and I'm either going to go back to school and become a, a proper animator, and I wanted to you know, animate for Disney uh, cartoons, 
or I'm going to move to New York and become a famous comic book artist. I remember working on, the first game I worked on was Smash TV, and I still thought, I'm going to save my money, and I'm still going to become a comic book artist and stop working on this video game nonsense. But I actually really love games. My two loves in life growing up were always comic books and video games, and, and film, of course. But games really started to kind of snowball for me, and I really started to appreciate just the opportunity to work on games. I'm just blessed to be able to do anything creative, I think. I was very lucky with them. But anyway, what I was going to get at was, even when I was working at Midway at the time, I still thought, hey, at some point, I'm going to go and do Captain America or something. And in fact, when I was working on Smash TV, I was still going to comic book conventions and showing my portfolio to people. And there was an editor at Marvel who was interested in hiring me to draw Captain America at the time. Unfortunately, the money that they paid for comic book art was very little. And so I was making a, just barely more at Midway at the time. So I decided to stick with what I was doing at Midway. And by the time they had come about, I think I had just started Mortal Kombat. By the time that they had said, hey, what do you think about illustrating comic books for us? The editor was a guy by the name of Mark Greenwald. I decided to stick with games, fortunately. And the next game that I did was, was actually Mortal Kombat. Honestly, one thing that I've always kind of been a little curious, John, and I'd love to di dive into it, is the ninjas that are in the franchise and the color scheme that we came out with, we have a character like Scorpion. And some zero makes sense, right? We, we've got the, the cold aesthetic, the blue, but the Scorpion being yellow, and then kind of the evolution of that with the different ninjas as they went along, where do those choices come, especially in the choice of color paletting and how that maybe influences character design and nuances and say the ninja gear. Any insights in there? Yeah, the first characters we knew that we needed to uh, do something to sort of deal with our memory limitations and then we'll point out games. Oh, sure, yeah. Right, that's right. So the idea was hey, any sort of palette swapping we could do might benefit us. And I had just done, I worked on a game called Smash TV. And on Smash TV, there were uh, these little, uh, the two player characters, there was a, there was, we called them Blue Guy and Red Guy. And I animated one collection of sprites and then we tinted the colors to get two. So we knew that we could do similar with. Mortal Kombat. So that, I think, was sort of the impetus of the idea was if we could create a character that we could send the palettes on and create an additional character for it, that would benefit us. And so I believe I sketched the Ninja Road World story for them. Then we decided, hey, they're perfect for doing the palette swapping no mass, so we wouldn't have to do any kind of head swapping or whatnot. So that's kind of how it started. Um, and then um, the choice of yellow, actually, I think had to do with um, the... I went to a costume shop and saw... I, I, the sketch I did was a character with this V-shaped tunic, and at the costume shop, coincidentally, they had this Gigas Khan costume that was similar to the shape that I had sketched, and so, um, but I think it had like, it had kind of side panels on the costume that we didn't kind of cut off, but it, so we bought that costume, I, I kind of manipulated a little bit, I cut off the sides of it, and we used that as a ninja costume, and that costume happened to be yellow. So we used, that's how Scorpion started with yellow, but Ed and I had discussed the idea of one of the characters being themed with fire, and one being themed Ice. So we kept Scorpion yellow, and then I think we do it in the natural because the icing character we're going to tint his tunic blue. That's how kind of that started. And then Snowball from there. And then the other ninja colors, I created sort of a, a bunch of different palettes, and then I gave Ed a collection of colors. And then actually, Ed, he created Reptile. He's the director was the first sort of secret character. Ed is the one who created the idea of Reptile and chose green and used green as a color. And then I think from every game after that, I again gave Ed sort of a rainbow palette. And colors. And he selected the colors and named the characters. And I actually didn't write the stories for those characters. But the idea of like even rain, that came from that. So I was a big Prince fan, used the purple palette, and they saw the character rain. I mean, maybe that's a little bit of a Prince style, purple rain. Oh, a little one, a big one. <laughs> I was actually curious because you were talking about the, the Scorpion outfit and everything. Was there any sort of potential inspiration from the fact that you get some sort of black and yellow scorpions at all as well? Or is that just a coincidence? It's just coincidence. Yeah, everything kind of snowballed once it worked out. One thing, too, I think a lot of fans have attached to, Yanni, is what the fans call the cat ears on the ninja buds. I mean, yeah, John, even you're giving a little chuckle at that. Where did that come from? Was that the same costume shop as the long panels of the V-neck? No, so actually the ninja cowl that we had I didn't really have the cat ears. That actually came about when there was a collector's edition comic that I had drawn that we sold through the game. 
And when I illustrated that comic book, the version of the characters in that comic were more, I think, my idealized version of what these characters would look like if they were perfect. And so that's what that represented. And for some reason, I'm sure the calls I'm using to the bills, I think you guys are this is fun. As I illustrated those characters, I did this, sort of this folded over piece you see the drawing right here. And that's how the, the, the kind of the cat ears came about. And that's sort of why, I think my version of the ninjas, they always have the cat ears. But that's kind of how that started. Was, was really with the, uh, was really with the um, the, the, the uh, comic book illustration that I did for the guy. And I will say as well, something you said before, and I, I love sharing it, especially the palette swapping and, and the, the early technologies that restrictions breed creativity, working within what you have, you know. But what's good about us, Yanni, is that we have an amazing freedom gaming and classic audience. And we're actually going to have the opportunity to open up for a little bit of Q&A as well. Uh, if you don't mind, John, we'd love to maybe draw and get some of those questions from our audience as well. So we have a few more here lined up on our side. Uh, I have Molly, and of course we've got the great fans of over here. They're going to be walking around, and if you have questions, feel free to go and buy them down, and uh, we'll see if we can get that question in. But Yanni, uh, do you have uh, another question here? So keep us thinking. So my first question is actually to the crowd. Have you guys figured out what is being thrown yet? Any guesses? Scorpion. Scorpion. We got one scorpion. Two scorpions. Two. I can see a grin over there, John. But we'll, we'll see if the prophecy comes to light. God, you mentioned in the past that you would have liked to age the main characters and potentially ship the roster to their children, as we've sort of seen with, with what happened in Mortal Kombat X. How does it feel to see the story of the franchise you helped establish continue to evolve without your input? And are you ever surprised by the developments like a fan might be now that you're no longer directly involved? Yeah, well, I think like everyone else now, always looking forward to the next version of the game. And the things that they're capable of doing today compared to the technology that we had back in the time, it's just amazing. When you watch sort of the complexity of the story modes today and the fact that they're actually doing proper story exposition. So, you know, back in the day, we didn't have dialogue. There was no way for the characters to exchange dialogue with each other. And so everything we did was sort of uh, because it was a wide story. So the choices we made were very specific. I mean, it was all about uh, telling as much story as we could without acting actual story exposition, but of course today it's quite different. Today, there's dialogue exchanges and there's just like, super dramatic cuts and things that we're able to do, but very entertaining to watch. And I think I've just, I like everybody else, just awed at the, the quality of the work that's being done and watching things come to life. It's funny because I think when the first, when the first Mortal Kombat film was released, one of my theories on why that film did so well is because players were able to see for the first time fully realized versions of these characters that we had only been able to allude to in the games and, and you know, the comics and things that we had inspired. And so it was super exciting, I think, for people to see everything come to life. Now, of course, with each iteration of the game, everything that wants life is so, is so beautiful. And I almost think that a, a film today is somewhat redundant, only because of the quality yeah. level of the work that they're doing on you know, the games themselves. I also, while we didn't have dialogue, we of course had some classic text lines like knowledge is power we do knowledge is power I mean get over here of course of course, of course. <laughs> uh, but speaking of getting over here I'm gonna get over to my friend Molly out there in the audience and John I think we might have a question here so ah, John's got a great question huh hey John yesterday at the reunion panel you mentioned how you love that character like new Cybot it helps resonate with people to know that you're still kind of like, we're involved at some point with this. What makes you think a character like you still to this day resonates with people? Because he just started out as a completely blackened sprite with Scorpion's moves. What makes you think that people still to this day, he's one of the most requested characters for modern world comedy in your own thoughts? Um, I would guess that a portion of it has to do with his playability, so the things that he does in new iterations of the game. I think that it's his characterization. In the new game, it's very, it's very cool. Like his relationship with the two Sub-Zero brothers, I think is a big component to that. 
But I think it really has a lot to do with the work that's being done you know, on the new game, the work that's been around this room. The new new sidebot designs are amazing. They're just beautifully designed. Yeah. And I think that that stuff really helps keep the character alive and helps keep the character relevant. I think, again, that has a lot to do with it. It's just sort of the modern day iterations of the character have been so great. So it's, it's an interesting one. Awesome. Thank you. That's a great question. And you know what I really appreciate too, and I'm just going to kind of echo a little bit of the sentiment. I think it's a combination. John, the design, the mysteriousness of it, along with also what I would say some great gameplay elements that was put into Doom. But even though I had a pretty bad matchup against him, I, I'm not a very good record against him, say, but, but he's just so cool the way that he does his thing. And it's very interesting to see now as well with the sort of evolution. As you mentioned, John, like how he's changed with an entirely new design, a very chaotic design, which lends itself to just the entire core aspect of his character changing rather than being another realm focus, being a chaos realm focus character. Just seeing that in the actual gameplay. Well, it looks like our, I have my friend Ben. So, I, do I have someone uh, asking a question back there? Yeah, I'm here with Bert, and Bert's got a question for you, John. Are there any canceled digits that you have? Uh, I don't think so. I think we can. I think we can use every color of the rainbow. And at this point, I can't. I don't remember one that uh, I think that we did that that didn't. Uh, didn't uh, actually take it into the game. So. Purple, red. Are we still not waiting for Pink Floyd? I'll also take different shades of turquoise as well. I appreciate, I'm always curious about that as well. Thank you for that question. That's a good one. Uh, Molly. Brian over here has got a great question. Hey, John. Uh, Brian, do you remember any Mortal Kombat when it went from Ultimate and Day 3 trilogy to Mortal Kombat 4 and you all transitioned with 3D? Were there any challenges or really cool things that you kind of experienced from an art side going from a two-dimensional game moving into that 3D plane? <laughs> Um, I don't remember any any specifics in terms of the choices of the character designs that we did. And, I mean, I think if anything, we were able to get a little bit more detailed with the character designs on, on MK4. One thing about MK4, though, I remember that the the body parts were kind of separated. We didn't do actual skinning back then, um, and. I vaguely remember us maybe having discussions even back on MK3 about the transition to 3D. Maybe Virtual Fighter had been released at the time, and I think so. Other teams in the studio were making the transition to 3D. I think maybe NFL Blitz was in development while we were working on this. But anyway, the idea of representing our characters as 3D, I remember at first, 3D was so primitive at the time, it was very blocky, and I thought there's no way we we're going to do our characters justice, you know, in, in, given the number of polygons that we had to use. But by the time we got to MK4, the development system that we were working on, I think allowed us to do a little bit more than we had done it a few years prior to that. And of course, I think with the later games, as you can see, the character designs have become more and more detailed, only because they're folks are able to kind of inject more and more detail from the technologies, the level of detail that they can inject in the Sure, and as the detail evolves, certainly seeing those in little designs, but you have to appreciate the originals. I mean, the, the spirit of inspiration is what brings it all from where it was. And I think we're going to go back over to, to Fanta, as we have another question in the queue. Yeah, that's right. I'm over here with Headlock Gaming. Headlock, go ahead. Yes, I was very curious. Do you have a favorite animation that you worked on? Why do you have a favorite animation? It's funny, so obviously the Mortal Kombat artist is, is uh, the work that I had done on it. So there's, inevitably, there's a bunch of favorites there. But I think when I think back at my work at Pigway, probably my favorite, some of my favorite work was done on a game called Smash TV, only because it was the first thing that I had worked on. And so I would say there was a character in Smash TV called Butoid Man. I think that's one of my favorites. No, I remember that. I, I remember going against the Mutoid Man or two, and I was like, oh gosh. Actually, in fact, I was just playing a little bit of Smash TV over in the arcade earlier. Uh, I'm not Game it now. After this, I mean, I'm kind of feeling inspired. <laughs> well, let's go over to Molly, who has a question on deck. Awesome. We've got the beautiful Joey and his parents. He's got a question. What do you got, Joey? Who was the first person you drew? 
Great question. First person I drew like ever. Well, I I've been drawing since I was like a, a wee lad, so probably when I was three years old. So, uh, I'm about three years old. I would guess one of the first things I drew was probably Batman, only because I was such a fan of the old TV series. And, and it's funny because I used to get really excited about watching TV or seeing movies. And a lot of times, like folks would take us to the movies, and I would come home so excited and energized, I would start to draw images of the movie that I had just seen. And uh, the one thing that I saved, I still have, is after we saw Star Wars the first time, I think I was like seven years old when I got home, and I tried to draw like an adaptation of Star Wars as a comic, and it was what I remembered as a kid of the movie I saw, but it's super entertaining. But I think Batman was probably the first superhero character I drew. Thank you. Definitely one of the most inspirational characters around. I would say it drew off quite a lot of different media from there. It looks like we're still probing for another question out there, but Yanni, I know you have quite a lot of things that you're curious about. Yeah, definitely. You've mentioned the sort of changing of designs as the game went on and such. So we, we talked about Duke Cyborg, for example, and I know it's been mentioned in the past, like Cabal in MK3, the idea was originally to give him a sort of trench coat, which didn't really make it in until the 3D era. But how does it feel to be able to see how intricate these designs have become from the good old days of Palace Wars? You know, the, the one thing I think, uh, and I can maybe I mentioned this a bit earlier, uh, about the earlier designs is because of the limitations of the hardware that we were working Working on at the time, it, it sort of forced us into making choices with it regarding character design to, to sort of adhere to kind of a, sim a simplicity to their design. And I think that that is in part, uh, or that had a lot to do, I think, with the iconic nature of whatever we think of the ninjas. For instance, it's always the color scheme. There's the shape of the tunic, and the I think the, even the new designs try to kind of adhere to the you know to the to the originals. And I think a lot of that has to do with the iconic nature you know of them but again I think that the design principles that we used in creating sort of the earlier characters I think ended up sort of benefiting us in sort of making the characters as iconic as they are now so whenever you think of Sub-Zero and, and Scorpion you think of the V shape of their tunic you think of the, the color schemes Raiden of course has the hat you could imagine those characters without those things yeah hopefully that answered the question yeah there's a sort of beauty in the simplicity which has been able right. to evolve over time yeah. Well, it looks like we've got another question from our audience up front here with Vansa. Yeah, I'm over here with Todd. I was just wondering if there's ever any plans for Mortal Kombat pinball machine. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, I think suddenly we have some excitement over a Mortal Kombat pin machine wall machine. Or what? I, I vaguely remember at the time being asked about uh, a Mortal Kombat pinball machine. There was an artist, it was a fellow by the name of Greg Ferris, who kind of ran uh, the pinball machine of art department and Williams Electronics at the time. And I remember him asking me if they had, if they do a pinball, Mortal Kombat pinball machine, would I be interested in, in drawing the back glass? Um, yes, please. Of course I was, but they haven't actually never ended up doing that for I don't know what reason. But I would love a, an MK. I love pinball, and I would love an MK pinball machine. And, and Ed coincidentally used to program pinball machines, so a lot of connectivity there between the work that we did and, and of course, the company that we worked with. Make it happen! Woo! <laughs> So, John, you left Midway, well, Midway, through Special Forces, and Special Forces led to characters like Tasia, No Face, and Tremor. How did it feel seeing, for example, Tremor make it into the main game in Mortal Kombat X so many years later? Yeah, Tremor! Woo! That was awesome. I actually love Tremor as a concept. I remember thinking of, like, okay, what's the next iteration of our ninja that we could create? And I thought, because Sub-Zero kind of had this elemental quality to him, and he was a Lin Kuei. I thought, okay, well, here's another Lin Kuei that you didn't know about. A fellow by the name of Tremor, who's kind of a big, the idea was he was a bigger, bulkier ninja, very muscular. I don't know what he turned out like, or if he even ended up in the Special Force skin that was eventually released. But I think the iteration of him that they did in NKX was fantastic. It was, it was kind of what I had imagined he could potentially become, I think, when we created him back then. So that was awesome to see. Wow. I love when those stories come around circle. It really is solid. Uh, Phantom, it looks like we got another question out there. Yeah, actually, we got a follow-up question to that from Evil Emperor X over here. 
I remember that name. So there was a, a, you know, a, a good while back, an action adventure Mortal Kombat game that many folks made out here, and I think it's one of the greatest Mortal Kombat games of all time. When are we finally going to get a Special Forces 2? <laughs> Actually, that's a question for him. <laughs> you know, I think if we start crowdfunding right now, we might be able to make some traction. What do you think, Yanni? So, but let's focus uh, on the actual donations first to the Raven Science Foundation, and then, then we can focus on Special Forces 2, maybe, or even Mythologies 2, right? There we go. So, I think we're starting to get a little bit closer to what this character might be. Yeah, I, I have no idea who that is. Anybody else? It looks like over here on the side, Molly has uh, another question. I've got the lovely Logan over here. What's your question, darling? Hi. The question is, what is a character that got cut that you regret cutting the most? I don't think we've really cut any characters. We were so frugal, and everything was so tight in terms of scheduling that we rarely threw anything out. But the one thing that I remember that was sort of painful for us was there was an iteration we did of Jax on MK2. We had, the initial design I did was Jax sort of wearing a karate game with cut off sleeves. It's kind of a yellow and black name in homage to uh, the game of death costume that Bruce, uh, that Bruce Lee had worn. Um, and so anyway, we actually um, uh, videotaped John Parrish in that costume and got through the entire session um, and uh, I digitized the sprites, cut them up, just not happy with the way that it looked. And I remember uh, calling Ed into my office and we kind of looked at it together and I just remember saying I did not like it and we decided to reshoot the character entirely. So we threw out all the sprites and started from scratch and I redesigned the costume and ended up being sort of the black, red, and white pants that you see wearing in, in, in the game now. Or an MK2. And in the point of that, we actually threw out. It was very painful uh, for us because we did work on a tight schedule. We didn't like throwing things away, but that was one that we decided not to use. Time is definitely a warrior's tool. Right over here, we've got, it looks like Phantom's itching to find some good questions out there. Yeah, I got another question over here from Tyler. Tyler, go ahead. John, what's the story on Midway bringing you back to do the prequel comic for Mortal Kombat vs. DC Universe? Oh, that was amazing. The story was actually Ed had called me and asked if I would be interested in doing something with them related to the game in the form of comic book. And for me, that was like an absolute dream come true because it was amazing sort of being able to illustrate the characters that I had a hand in creating and along with characters that I had admired growing up. So Superman, and, and I mentioned Batman was probably one of the first characters I'd ever drawn. And so the, just having the opportunity to kind of illustrate them professionally was a dream come true for me. But the story was as simple as they were developing the game, they had decided that they wanted to do a comic book, and so Ed had thought of me and reached out to me and asked if I'd be interested in the divorce. I was 100% interested. I mean, that's a dream yeah. right there. Yeah. That, that actually leads me to a follow-up question. Do you ever see such a thing happening again that we potentially see John, Tobias, and Ed Boon working together in Mortal Kombat at any point, even in a collaboration? I get asked that all the time, and I always say, maybe somewhere in an alternate universe is a version of me <laughs> that is still working on the game, but it's not this one. <laughs> And I don't know, I do, you know, never say never, but sure. we're very busy, and those guys certainly don't need my help right now. So they're doing a fantastic job. You know, just because I, I, I'm going to indulge myself here for a second, Yanni, as I think you and I both, John, are, are legacy fans of DC and Marvel and other comics, is there any DC character you wish would have made its way? I don't know why, but I would have loved to see the question yeah. in there, especially with maybe some of those showdowns. I would love to see that intellect get in there. He's one of my favorite ones. Hawkgirl, I think, is great. Oh, is there any character along that line or favorite DC character? Like, oh, I wish I would have been in there. Plastic thing. I don't think Plastic Man was in there. Plastic? No. Yeah. That, Plastic Man 2? I mean, ima imagine for a second the finishers that Plastic Man could have, because he does not hold back. That guy's got a power set. You don't want to mess with Plastic Man. I mean, it, it's, it's like a joke, but at the same time, it's ridiculous how strong he is, right? So, Plastic Man's a good choice. Looks like we got some more questions coming from Phantom over there. Yes, I do. I got a question over here from Justin. So, Justin, who was up there? Now, I was just curious, out of the original game, which character was the most labor-intensive to create? 
Goro was the most labor intensive yeah. character. Uh, and that was because, of course, we hand animated a stop motion miniature, of course. Um, that was a lot of work. But it is such a, a notable character that stands out. Like, the things of promotion, like, I walk by those arcade cabinets, and when I see them, I'm like, okay, yes, I did it. It had that visceral reaction. It doesn't matter where it is graphically or in between, it definitely resonates. Do you have another one over there, Phantom? Yeah, I do. I got one more, and this one is a little off topic, but not quite when you consider John, you made Mortal Kombat. So, let's go ahead. Thanks, brother. So, uh, John, uh, you recently uh, stated that you had watched uh, the television series Mortal Kombat Conquest, uh, and you rather uh, really enjoyed the portrayal of Shang Tsung uh, by Bruce Law. Um, is there anything in particular that really stood out to you with that performance? And is there any other highlights uh, from the series that uh, really struck a high note with you? Well, regarding Bruce Locke, I mean, especially coming off a character Gawa's performance in the first MK film, I remember thinking, how are we going to top that? How are you going to find another Shang Tsung? And I thought that the actor who portrayed him in the TV series actually held his own. I thought him. so, too. Yeah, and so that was a pleasant surprise, I think, for me. But in terms of the series, any standouts, I think it was when Duke Saibot showed up. That was pretty amazing. It's surreal. Thank you for that question, and that leads me to another follow-up. How would you compare Conquest to say Legacy. Did you get a chance to check out Legacy? What were your thoughts on it? I did see Legacy, yeah. Got some, a bit of a deviation at the time, but Legacy was pretty good. It was, I um, thought it was a legit production. It looked great. There was a, a, a sequence with the Cyber Ninjas fighting each other. I thought that was amazing. A great, great fight. There was an actor named Matt Mullins who portrayed Johnny Cage. Yeah, yeah, that was Matt, Matt Mullins before, in the second season, it was Casper Van Dien. Right, okay, so Matt Mullins, who played Johnny Cage in the, I guess it was the first season of that show. Coincidentally, well, Matt Mullins did mocap. I worked at a game called Tau Fei from Microsoft. Yeah! Woo! And Matt Mullins was one of our mocap actors. And so that was, it was crazy seeing him as Johnny Cage all those years later. I mean, I guess it's kind of a coincidence. And then um, Matt was actually trained by a fellow by the name of Matt, Mike Chatteradova, who also did mocap for us for Telfane. And Mike Chat, um, Ed and I actually met when we, he was, I think he was 12 years old or something at the time. Ed and I did some training at a health club, and there was a, it was actually also a pack we were working with. But Hosung Pat, I think, trained Mike Chat for a little bit when he was very young. And then Mike Chat grew up, and coincidentally, I, uh, we got connected with Mike, I think, for maybe his agent. You know, we're, we were working with a, a martial arts who knew Mike had brought him on. And then Mike told me the story of meeting us way back when. And then Mike trained Matt Mullins, who, had, when I worked with him, was like 20 years old or something. And then, of course, years later, Small world. <laughs> Small world indeed. I mean, I guess that kind of connects to also some of those Disney movies that you saw with It's a Small World. But I would like to kind of go to the concept of being an animator, a, a jar, an artist. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are also exploring that world. What bit of advice would you give to someone that is starting to get into the world of hand drawing, of character design? Something that maybe the foresight of, of experience would give someone a good navigational direction to continue to take that journey? Um, I would say consume a lot of media and take in everything and let it all kind of influence you. And then I would say just practice and proliferation. The more you draw, the better you get. The more you draw, the more you develop your needs. At some point in your career, you give in to the stylistic qualities of the way you draw and you stop trying to be like someone else. And you just accept who you are in the way that you draw. And it's unique to you. So whenever you see my drawings, it really is just now, at this point, this is just how I draw. I'm not trying to replicate anything else that I've seen. I'm just drawing the way that I draw. But I think that only comes through just years of, years and years of practice. And I don't draw as much now as I wish I could. A lot of what you see me do today just came from years and years of practice. Would you say your style has sort of evolved? Like now, looking back at your old art, say your original art for Scorpion, and comparing it to what you're doing now, would you say that there's much of a difference in how you approach it and how it looks, the end result? 
I don't know if I approach the, the, the base of what I do is kind of the same as, I, as I've always done. And I think that has a lot to do with, you know, I went to art school and a lot of what I know I learned, I was taught. And then just over the years, it kind of evolves into your own thing. But really when I draw right now, I almost zone out. Like I, I can talk about what I'm doing, but a lot of it is just an instinct at this point. And it really is just kind of what comes out of me. Do you think you could sum up here in a few words or sentences, what do you see your drawing side? Is it fanciful? Is it realistic? Is it visceral? Is there? I, I, it's it's kind of hard to put one styling into words. I know, like when I do it, I really go into hyperbole. Is there a way that you can kind of describe what you see your drawing style as today? Um, I've never thought of answering that question. I have no idea. I think that there's probably, again, subconsciously, the stylistic qualities of my drawing probably have a lot to do with the comic book artists that I grew up reading. And I remember being a certain age, and all I needed to see was a drawing, and I could tell you which art. I think that probably there's a, subconsciously there's a lot of that stuff in what I do. I've heard people mention, like, oh, you know, you draw like this person, you draw like that person. And it's probably true. I bet you subconsciously I, I looked at their art over the years and it just found its way into the work that I do. I think if there were two words that we could say is this style, I think it's John Tobias. That's perfect. Yeah, I, I think John, would you agree with that? Yeah. <laughs> John, do you have a favorite Mortal Kombat character to draw? To draw? Yeah. Bigger than ninjas. They're the easiest. <laughs> Just by drawing them now. Um, I don't know if I have a favorite. I think it's probably the ninjas only because of the, the visual nature. They're, you know, they're so iconic. I love drawing war. Girls a lot of Yeah! Fun. Raiden's fun too. I finally got the hat down. I actually just drew Raiden. They're gonna auction it off. I drew on a PlayStation 5. I drew a headshot of Raiden. They're gonna auction it off. But I love drawing Raiden. Uh, but Coral, Raiden, and the yeah. Ninja are my favorite because I think they're the most visually you know, it, it is with the efforts of people like you, John, and of course the strength of characters like Raven, and of course Scorpion, and Goro. It is that strength that allows us to continue to push forward with the Raven Science Foundation. And once more, I encourage everyone to take a look. There's a lot of great things they have on offer, both in Sound Auction and Raffle for Raven Science Foundation. I know that's what brought all of us out here for the streaming panel. So anything you can do, small, large, it all add up to help us combat rare diseases with genetic research and strength with all the fun you're going to leave. Any support is appreciated. Yeah, I mean, I am here for the Brain Science Foundation specifically, so, I, you know, um, we appreciate any donations. That's right. So, we ask everyone to please stick around here. Uh, oh, I think I see. Is that Sonia Blade? I think that might be Sonia Blade. Dare I church you screaming? Right. I do not put this costume on for anybody. <laughs> Wait, this yeah. is the last time I'm ever putting this on. I'm kind of speechless right now. No, after I saw Carrie on the panel through the whole fatality guess, and now this is coming true, I might, I might be dying inside. But you know what? Uh, well, I'm going to keep it together. Uh, but before we uh, go any further, I, I would ask everyone to please give a massive round of applause to our amazing artists and the great friend of the Rain Science Foundation, John Jones. Thank you so much. So stay in your seats because there's going to be surprises, Johnny, that I don't even know is going to happen yet. So be here. It's going to be great. John, thank you one more time. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Great. Hope you all enjoyed this video. Uh, I still cannot believe that this happened. It was it was really a surreal experience to be able to meet everybody. Everybody was so kind, Phantom, you know, like not just Ed, John, Kerry and Sal, but everybody, the, the convention staff. Thank you to everybody there. Uh, special shout out to Corey and Tom, of course, meeting the community members. I mean, I'm not going to say everybody's names. I'm going to mention a couple of people, but Aluminum, uh, Tab Mock, you know, uh, getting to meet Uppercut Editions and of course, getting to meet you, Phantom, for the first time in person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. It's crazy. And also that reminds me, uh, if anybody wants to see the full unedited video, Tabmock99 did upload it for the panel. We're the only ones that have the drawing session and those questions. But if you want to see us stutter through any questions and make fun of us, <laughs> that's available over there. Mortal Kombat Online contributor Tabmock99. So be sure to check that out. We also got to meet ESO13, amazing Mortal Kombat artist who was at our booth selling his artworks. And oh my God, they are even more beautiful in person than they are online, which I didn't realize was even possible. 
So that Speaking was of awesome. Esau 13. Esau actually designed our brand new Realm yes, Cast did. Meme Realm shirts. Uh, so we have quite a few variations. If you're interested in any of these, you can find them at shop.realmcast.com. Uh, my favorite is the Sindel smacking katana one. And, so, and, and for the record, Ed and John laughed so hard at them too. Yes, Thanks. yes. <laughs> so if you guys are interested, be sure to stop by there and support the channel. And once again, go check out Rain the Science Foundation. They have some amazing auctions and raffles that they run. You can get autographed various items from Ed and John through the Rain of Science Foundation. And all of it goes to a good cause. You are supporting the fight against these rare diseases that they've been working so hard to combat. They're an amazing family. They deserve your help. And of course, it's not just them you're helping. You're helping anybody else who might have certain rare diseases, which just don't have any treatment available for at the moment. So please, you know, give them a little bit of your time. See if you can actually spare a donation as well. It really is a good cause. Thank you to all of our listeners for stopping by the Realmcast and joining us on this episode. If you enjoyed this interview and would like to further support the show, then consider buying us a coffee, which you can do through the link in the description. You can find Yanni and myself, Phantom, on all our social media pages at Realmcast. Join our official Discord channel hosted on Mortal Kombat online server, also through the link in the description, where we discuss Mortal Kombat along with our listeners. Special thanks to Uppercut Editions and Collector's Maze for their continued support. The Realmcast is the official podcast of Mortal Kombat Online. Catch up on all episodes of the Realmcast or join us on our live show, The Soul Stream, on YouTube, Facebook, iTunes, Spotify, MortalCombatOnline.com, or RealmCast.com. Phantom, what does Mortal Kombat mean to you? Mortal Kombat is life. Oh, it's so